this lecture is the start of our next big unit on the theory of modules. And today I'll talk about just the first part of section 10.1 of Dummett and Foot, which is uh, about basic definitions and examples. And I'm actually going to start with something from a little bit before this course. What I want to try to do is convince you that there is this whole set of new definitions that's going to come up very quickly, but the definitions around modules are very, very similar to things that you've already seen and know well. So one of the big ideas for the theory of modules is that it's going to give us a common language to talk about several different things that we already know well. OK, let's say that F is a field. A set V is a vector space over F if it satisfies the following axioms. It has a binary operation plus that turns V into an abelian group. And there's a scalar multiplication operation, dot, which you can think of as a function from F cross V to V, denoted alpha dot V, where alpha is some element of your field F, and V is some element of your set V, some vector in V, if you like. And this operation has to satisfy a kind of distribution property, alpha plus beta times, or dot V is alpha dot V plus beta times plus beta dot V, where the first plus here, this is addition in F, and the second plus here, this is that uh, binary operation plus on V. We're using the same symbol for both, um, but once you get used to this, it shouldn't be confusing. Uh, you need to satisfy that alpha times beta, where this is multiplication in F so dot V, is the same as alpha dot beta dot V. So beta dot V is some element of V, some vector, and uh, alpha dot that vector in V, that's the same thing as if you multiplied first and then acted on V. So this scalar multiplication operation is compatible with the multiplication operation in your field F. It has to satisfy another kind of distribution law that alpha dot V plus W is alpha dot V plus alpha dot W, where alpha is some element of your field, and V and W are two vectors in your set V. And uh, F is a field, so it has an identity. The identity uh, dot V always just gives you back V for any V in your big set, uh, any vector in your set. OK, so this is something that we know well from linear algebra. And this could be a starting point for how you think about modules. There's one more definition I want to give because it's going to um, play an important role in one of the key examples that we'll talk about starting in the next lecture, which is let me just recall what it means to have a linear transformation between two vector spaces. So let's say that V and W are vector spaces over the same field F. You have a function from V to W. That function is a linear transformation if F of U plus V, where the addition here is in the vector space V, uh, is equal to F of U plus F of V, where now that addition is in the vector space W. So this function is compatible with addition on both sides. And F of this scalar multiplica multiplication alpha dot V is the same as alpha dot F of V. So the scalar multiplication on V and the scalar multiplication on W are compatible with respect to this function. OK, so we'll come back to this uh, in a little bit. So given all of this discussion of vector spaces, what is a module over a ring? So R is going to be a ring, not necessarily commutative and not necessarily with identity. But in practice, almost all of the examples that we look at are going to be in the case where R is a ring with identity, and most of them also will be in the case where R is commutative. A left R module, or left module over R, those mean the same thing, is a set M together with some things. One, a binary operation plus on M under which M plus becomes an abelian group. So look at this axiom compared to the first vector space axiom. M plus is just going to be an abelian group. And 
It comes with an action of R on M. What is that? That's a map dot from R cross M to M denoted by R dot M, where R is going to be some element of the ring. M is going to be some element of this set M. And it has to satisfy several things. A kind of distribution property, R plus S dot M is equal to R dot M plus S dot M for all R and S in the ring and M in this set capital M. Multiplication in the ring is compatible with this action of R on M. So R times S dot M is the same as R dot S dot M. And another kind of distribution, R dot the sum of M plus N, where these are two elements in your set capital M, which remember already has a, a binary operation plus on it under which it becomes an abelian group. R dot M plus N is R dot M plus R dot N for all R in the ring, M and N in the set M. OK, so remember, R is a ring not necessarily with an identity. If R does have an identity, we're going to require a little more, which is 1 dot M should be M for all M in this set M. So if you have a set M together with all of these things, that is a left R module. OK, so before I erase, I just want to point out, if you look at these axioms and you look at these axioms, in the case where R is actually a field, OK, so then you'll have identity. You'll require this last one. Uh, then the axioms here and the axioms here are exactly the same thing. So what is one way to start thinking about modules is, well, a first example is that when R is a field, modules over a field, uh, I'll say modules over a field. Right now, I've just said left R module. We're going to give a completely, you can give a completely parallel definition for right R module. But when the ring is commutative, these are the same thing. So when R is a field, a module M over your field F is exactly the same thing as a vector space over F. OK, so I'll pause and erase. And that's our first example. And the goal of this lecture is going to be to introduce some of the other key basic examples that will help you to think about modules. I'll leave up the definition here for a left R module and emphasize some of the things that I just said very quickly. Uh, and also introduce a little bit of new notation. So this D, where your ring has a 1, uh, 1 dot M equals M for all M in your module. The modules that satisfy this condition D are called unital modules. And from now on, all of our modules are going to be unital, by which I mean Dummett and Foote say, from now on, all of our modules are going to be unital. I think in part what this means is that uh, you should just assume whenever you see left R module or R module that you're talking about a unital module. There are some things that are in uh, the presentation in Dummett and Foot that even would apply to modules that don't satisfy this condition. But it's better not to worry about it and just assume that all modules satisfy this condition. So why do you want your modules to be unital? Well, one thing that that avoids is if you assume your module is unital, then this avoids uh, pathologies. For example, you could just set the, um, the action of R on M to be the completely trivial one, where R dot M equals 0 for all R and R and M and M. So you can see that that's going to satisfy these uh, first three uh, axioms. But if you suppose that your module has to be unital, then it certainly doesn't uh, satisfy this last one. So uh, just like often in statements, we assumed that our ring R has an identity 1 not equal to 0 to avoid the case of R being the 0 ring, we'll assume that our modules are unital to avoid bad things like this. OK, so this is all a definition of a left R module. 
we can make a completely parallel definition of a right R module. We're now, we need an action of R on M on the right instead of on the left. So it would be a function, a map from M cross R to M denoted M dot R. So the ring element now is on the right and the module element is on the left. And you're just switching the order of everything here. When R is commutative, left R modules and right R modules are exactly the same thing. And you can check that that's true. Uh, but when R is not commutative, they really are not necessarily the same thing. So this is a kind of subtle issue. And uh, I mean, it really is easier to first think hard about the case of modules over a commutative ring. And then once you understand modules over commutative rings well, uh, you can go and think hard about how things change when you uh, have this distinction between left R modules and right R modules. So almost all of what we'll talk about, you can assume that R is going to be a commutative uh, ring. OK, and then the last thing I want to emphasize is what I was saying from the beginning by writing down the axioms for a vector space over a field. When R is a field, OK, now you're in the case where you have a, a commutative ring and left R modules, right R modules are the same. And we see that the axioms match up. So R modules are exactly vector spaces over, let me say, F. When R equals F is a field, they're exactly vector spaces over this field, R. OK. So one thing I want to say also for clarity is a lot of times when we make statements, we'll say things like, let M be an R module. And if R is commutative, it's a left R module, it's a right R module, that's the same thing. But maybe we're making a statement that doesn't require that R is commutative. So when I say let R M be an R module, do I mean left R module or right R module or both? And uh, dominant foot do this thing that I'm going to go with for consistency that if we don't specify left R module versus right R module and just say like let M be an R module, we mean let M be an at left R module. All right, so here's the first definition that, that uses this uh, distinction. So let's say R is a ring and M is an R module. OK, so if R is a commutative ring, no confusion here. If R is not necessarily commutative, suppose that M is it now actually a left R module. An R submodule of M is a subgroup N of M that is closed under the action of ring elements. So it's a subgroup of M plus. And you have to have the property that R dot N is in N, that you uh, act on the elements of this subgroup by any ring element, and you stay in N. You know that R dot N is in M. So it really is requiring something to say that R dot N stays in N for all R in the ring and N in this subgroup. So submodules are subsets which are themselves modules under the restrictions of the plus and dot operations. So this should sound really similar to uh, what is a subgroup is it's a subset that is itself a group under the restriction of the same operation. OK. So I'll pause and erase, and I'll talk about some more uh, basic examples to keep in mind. Let's talk a little bit about some basic examples. Let's say that M is an R module. Well, what submodules does it have to have? M is a submodule of M. And 0, the identity of the abelian group M plus, that's also a submodule of M. Both of these things are very easy to check. The second one is called the trivial submodule. Uh, those are two modules, submodules that you always have. OK, so what about in this case where R is a field? So if R equals F is a field, then V is an F module. That's the same thing as uh, V being a vector space over F. What is the vector space thing that corresponds to being a submodule? They're exactly the subspaces, the vector subspaces of V. OK, let's now get into one of the first big examples that motivate studying the theory of modules in general. Let's say that R is any ring. 
So not necessarily commutative and even not necessarily with identity. So this is one case where we're maybe not going to require that all of our modules be unit all. So R is any ring. Take M equals R. This is a left R module over R. What is the action of R on M, which is also R? It just is going to be multiplication. So we define R dot M, this action of R on R, to be R times M. So this uh, action is just multiplication. OK, so it's easy to check. Why is this a left R module? Well, the things, the module axioms you need to check all come directly from the ring axioms. The fact that R is a ring gives you that it is a left R module over itself. OK, so if R is a field, then F is an F module with a left F module over itself. F is commutative, so it's just an F module. So F is a vector space over F. And in fact, I mean, it is a one-dimensional vector space over F. We'll talk more about dimension uh, and generating sets and things like that later. But this should match up with what you know from linear algebra. Uh, maybe not even thinking about the general case of F being a field, R is a one-dimensional vector space over R. Right. OK. So if you think of R as being a left module over itself, what are the submodules? And if you look at what it means to be a submodule, you see that these are exactly the left ideals of R. So you're looking for a subset of your module R that is itself a module under restriction of these operations. So what do you need? You need a subgroup of R. And you need the property that R dot M lands in that subgroup for all R in the ring and M in the subgroup. So this is something really to think about to like look at the, uh, the definition here, because R can be any element in the ring. R can be things that are in R that are not necessarily in the subgroup. So the right notion of a submodule here is not a sub ring, but it's an ideal. OK, so uh, in the next video, we'll introduce some other key examples of modules and their submodules.